Good afternoon. Um, welcome to another highlight in our full and rich academic year, the Oliver C. Schroeder Jr. Scholar in Residence Lecture, which this year is being delivered by Ralph Tyler, former chair of the FDA, former chief counsel of the FDA. Um, let me talk about the fund a little bit, then I'll talk about the director of our law medicine program, Max Melman, who will introduce our speaker. Um, Oliver C. Schroeder Jr. was the founder of our Law Medicine Center here at Case Western Reserve School of Law, effectively beginning the field of health law uh, in 1953. From 1953 until 1986, uh, Schroeder oversaw the center, which has grown and expanded uh, in response to the changing field of health care. And we all know how dramatically the field of health care has changed and is in the process of changing even as we speak. Uh, upon his retirement in 1986, friends and colleagues established the Oliver C. Schroeder Jr. Endowment Fund in his honor uh, to benefit the Law Medicine Center. Thanks to his endowment, the center has been able to enrich the health law program by bringing scholars and practitioners of distinction to lecture and spend time with students. The director of our Law Medicine Center, Max Melman, is one of the shining stars in the firmament of our faculty which is a faculty that is studded with stars, but Max is special. Max is the Arthur E. Peter Silge Professor of Law and, as I said, Director of the Law Medicine Center here, and Professor of Biomedical Ethics at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Max receives his JD from Yale Law School in 1975, um, had an entertaining time passing the bar exam, as I learned this morning, uh, which he did on the first try. Um, <laughs> and has two bachelor's degrees, one from Reed College and one from Oxford University, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. Prior to joining our faculty in 1984, Max practiced law with Arnold and Porter in Washington, where he specialized in the federal regulation of healthcare and medical technology. Professor Melman served from 1987 to 1990 as a member of the committee to design a strategy for quality review and assurance in Medicare of the Institute of Medicine National Academy of Sciences. It's quite a mouthful, Max. Um, from 1988 to 1994, he served as special counsel to the Special Committee on Medical Malpractice of the New York State Bar. In 1992, Max was a consultant on medical malpractice to the AARP, of which we all become <laughs> members at the advanced age of 50. Um, in 2003, he served as an advisor for the project on medical liability in Pennsylvania funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts in connection with which we wrote a report entitled Resolving the Medical Malpractice Crisis, Fairness Considerations. In 2007, along with Dale Nance, Max authored a book entitled Medical Injustice, The Case Against Health Courts, with research funding from the American Association for Justice Robert L. Haybush Endowment. Max is truly a first-rate scholar, one of the leading minds in this field, um, it is my pleasure to serve on faculty with him. And so I happily introduce him um, now to introduce Ralph Tyler. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was accidentally drunk uh, when I took the bar exam. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, good afternoon. So I'd like to welcome you to the Schroeder Lecture. Uh, the Schroeder Lecture honors, uh, as the Dean said, uh, Oliver Schroeder, and each year we um, uh, uh, nominate and invite a distinguished individual who plays an exceptional role in the fields of health law and policy. It's especially gratifying when the person designated as the Schroeder Scholar is a graduate of our law school, and therefore it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Ralph Tyler III, class of 1972, this year's Schroeder Scholar, who will be speaking on the goals of FDA regulation and the challenges of meeting them. Ralph received his BA from the University of Illinois, his JD as I said from here, and then an LLM from Harvard Law School. He was a managing attorney at the Greater Boston Legal Services, then a staff attorney in the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute, and from 1978 to 1980 an assistant professor of law and director of clinical legal education at Cleveland Marshall. This was followed by a teaching job at the National University of Singapore. When he returned to the States in 1982, he began his long and distinguished career in government service, serving in the Amer Maryland Attorney General's office until 1996, during the last five years as Deputy Attorney General of the state. In 1989, he argued Baltimore Department of Social Services versus 
Book Knight or Back Knight? Book Knight. Um, in the U.S. Supreme Court and won a 7-2 to two decision in favor of the city being able to compel a mother over her Fifth Amendment objections to uh, produce a child she was suspected of abusing. In 1995, Ralph successfully defended the state against a suit by a defeated Republican gubernatorial candidate uh, who was contending election irregularities uh, and who claimed that, quote, more, tur more than turkeys were stuffed in Baltimore this Thanksgiving. The judge threw the suit out as, uh, as trivial, or as Ralph put it, the challenger's claims boiled down to throwing out 1.4 million votes cast simply because 1,816 people weren't purged from the Baltimore City voting list and 1,322 hadn't changed their addresses. When he left the Attorney General's office in 1996 to become a partner in the Baltimore office of Hogan and Hartson, Attorney General uh, uh, J. Joseph Curran, Jr. said Ralph clearly was one of the best lawyers in the office, adding that he was a teacher and an example setter by his independent analysis of legal issues we face. Two years later, by the way, Ralph returned the compliment by calling Curran the Cal Ripken of attorneys general. While in private practice, Ralph was never far from the wheels of government. In 2001, Attorney General Curran hired him to fight Maryland attorney and Orioles owner Peter Angelos over payments Angelos was supposed to receive for handling Maryland's suit against the tobacco industry, and over Angelos' claim that his team had not gotten as good a deal from the Maryland Stadium Authority as the Ravens. Moreover, Ralph began to get public kudos for his elocution. A federal court of appeals judge whom Ralph had worked for in the state attorney general's office, for example, described him at the time as a creative lawyer and a superb advocate, adding that he's got great ingenuity, enormous resources, he's very smart and thinks well on his feet, and he has a beautiful deep voice. He's exactly what you'd want your lawyer to be. In 2004, Ralph was back in the government full-time as Baltimore City Solicitor. The mayor of Baltimore found it humbling that Tyler is willing to forego private practice at a high-caliber law firm to return to public service and the difficult, often thankless work it entails. In 2006, an article in the Baltimore Sun described Ralph as a Cleveland native with a fondness for reading histories and biographies, especially about Watergate and President Nixon, and noted that he was a sailing aficionado. That year, he fought the energy company's efforts to obtain a 72% rate increase, which culminated in the legislature ousting the members of the state's public service commission. The city's deputy mayor commented that Ralph's, quote, greatest gift is to take a complex issue and strip it to, down to its core, and called attention again to Ralph's impressive manner of speech, saying, everyone kept saying 72% was inevitable, and in his booming voice, he would say, why? Sure enough, when Ralph was named State Insurance Commissioner in 2007, the Baltimore Sun said he was, quote, known for his aggressive courtroom advocacy and for his booming voice. After serving as Insurance Commissioner and as Chief Legal Counsel in the Office of the Governor, Ralph accepted the post of Chief Counsel of the Food and Drug Administration. The Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs described him as a Chief Counsel who understands what a good counselor and advocate in the government should be. He spearheaded a, the agency's efforts to hold drug company executives accountable for regulatory violations. In April 2010, he redefined the role of chief counsel as someone who finds ways to facilitate his client's policy objectives within the law rather than limiting the agency to specific regulatory approaches authorized by Congress. And when he resigned the chief counsel's position this past summer, which was followed by him joining the Venable firm in Baltimore, FDA Commissioner Margaret Hamburg complimented him, quote, for his unwavering dedication, sharp thinking, and dry wit. Please join me in welcoming Ralph Tyler. Well, if nothing else, that changes my views about Google. I mean, you can now find all this stuff about people, only some of which is true. Um, well, good afternoon. It is a great great pleasure and uh, opportunity to be here. I've spent the last uh, two days here and I've had the opportunity uh, to, to meet the dean, to meet with students, to meet with the faculty, um, and now uh, to talk with you. Um, one, it's hard to imagine that there's anything that Max omitted, but he did omit one thing, um, w which may set me apart from others who have had the privilege of participating in this lecture s series, uh, and that is that um, I was actually taught by Oliver Schroeder. Uh, I started at this law school uh, in the fall of 1969, 
And among other things that Professor Schroeder did at the time um, is he taught, he taught torts, uh, which unfortunately was taught at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, but I did a, on occasion attend. Um, and whatever I didn't get out of it, that was my fault and not his. Um, so it, it is certainly a privilege uh, to be here in this capacity uh, and to, to talk, uh, to have a chance to talk with you. What I propose to do is to talk for a bit and then I would hope that um, there will be an interest in some discussion and that um, what I have to say perhaps will stimulate some thoughts or you have questions to begin with, um, but then let us begin. Um, I'm going to talk this afternoon about regulation specifically about regulation of products uh, within the jurisdiction of the United States Food and Drug Administration. My perspective is, of course, shaped by my former work as counsel to FDA. For students of administrative law and for lawyers practicing before administrative agencies, terms such as administrative law or regulatory law bring to mind legal doctrines such as delegation of legislative authority from Congress, for example, or statutory principles such as notice and comment rulemaking. These doctrines and principles are certainly important to parties affected by agency actions, to counsel who, appear, who practice before agencies, and to courts reviewing agency actions. I would argue, however, that these doctrines and principles provide very little insight into most of the substantive work in which regulatory agencies are engaged every day. In addition, these legal doctrines and principles do not inform our ongoing national debate about the proper role of regulation in our economic system. Two fundamental questions must be addressed to understand and to evaluate the work of an administrative agency. First, is there a need to regulate in a particular area? And second, how should an agency operate to solve the problem which was the reason for determining that a need for regulation existed? Obviously, one reaches the second question of how to regulate only if the answer to the first question is that there is a need to regulate. Why then do we have an FDA? Put another way, do we need an FDA? As many of you will recall, the predecessor of the modern FDA had its, had its origins in response to Upton Sinclair's classic novel, The Jungle, which was published in the early 1900s. The Jungle is remembered most often for its graphic depiction of the unsafe and insanitary conditions in the Chicago slaughterhouses of the time. The novel is about much more than that, however. The Jungle is the story of Jurgis Rudkus and his family, an immigrant family who are living a squalid, poverty-burdened existence in Chicago. This family is oppressed by all the institutional forces with which they are forced to interact, including employers, landlords, and financial institutions. There is nothing subtle about the theme of The Jungle. The bluntly stated theme is that unchecked economic power acts in an oppressive fashion. For Jurgis Rudkus and his family, there is seemingly no prospect for relief from this oppression. In the final third or so of the novel, however, Upton Sinclair gives his answer to how the crushing burdens of the Rudkus family and others like them will be relieved. For Upton Sinclair, Speaking through Jurgis Rutkus, socialism is the answer. The jungle had a huge impact. The United States, starting with its then president, Theodore Roosevelt, took to heart the social and economic problems which Upton Sinclair portrayed so effectively, but rejected Sinclair's solution. The American model, the public policy response to the jungle, was not socialism, as Sinclair proposed, but the establishment of institutions of public power to balance, if not control, the major institutions of private power. The United States Food and Drug Administration 
is perhaps the most prominent example of this model. FDA exists because of the belief that without regulation, meaning governmentally established and enforced rules and standards, life essential goods such as safe food and safe and effective drugs and medical devices are less likely to be available. I submit that this belief is rooted in fact. Consumers lack the information and the ability to monitor the safety of the food supply, the food supply chain once the world changes from a place where people grow their own food or obtain it from their neighbors to a world in which food is grown and packaged far from where it is consumed, now often in other countries. Similarly, with respect to drugs, there is no substitute for a well-controlled clinical trial to establish a drug's safety and effectiveness. And conducting such a trial is beyond the competence of individual consumers. Consumers, unprotected by regulations requiring such trials, are unable to judge the safety and effectiveness of a drug. The alternative to regulation in the areas of food, drugs, and medical devices is a marketplace flooded with products which carry no greater assurance of safety, efficacy, and purity than the unverified and self-interested representations, representations of those producing the products. Because of the risks inherent in that alternative, there is a strong consensus in our country and, it, and indeed across much of the world that regulation in the areas of food and medical products is necessary. There are many, many complaints about how FDA operates. These complaints focus on the agency's fairness, including the perception of some that is too close to the industries it regulates, its effectiveness, its slowness, and the costs of, of compliance. What is notable, however, is that few people, even FDA's severest critics, suggest that consumers would be protected adequately, let alone better protected, if there were no FDA, and instead we had a system which permitted the unrestricted marketing, distribution, and sale of food and medical products. This is because not many people believe that the marketplace alone, or the marketplace supplemented by the civil tort system, would police the marketplace sufficiently to assure a reasonable level of safety and protection. The food and drug regulatory system has its weaknesses, and most certainly it, it has its critics. But regulation in these areas is generally recognized as far preferable to no regulation. <laughs> if the answer to the question of why do we have an FDA is clear and widely accepted, the answer to the question of how FDA should operate is far less clear and is considerably more controversial. Even after a century of food and drug regulation, there is no consensus in our country on many central questions. These questions include how should FDA be organized to do its work most effectively? What resources does FDA need to meet its responsibility? And what percentage of FDA's funding should be general tax, re tax revenues and what percentage should be industry paid user fees? And perhaps most significantly, in the medical products area, there is little agreement <clears throat> on the core policy question of how much risk FDA should tolerate when, for example, it reviews products to allow them onto the market or when FDA acts to remove approved products from the market. Since the adoption of the first version of the, of the Federal Food and Drug Act in 1906, Congress has enacted more than 200 laws related to the manufacture, distribution, and sale of food, health products, and most recently tobacco products. The agency, in turn, has adopted hundreds of implementing regulations and issued many guidance documents. <clears throat> 
Nevertheless, the regulatory framework is unsettled, and there are now, as there have been in the past, demands in Congress and elsewhere to change the laws under which FDA operates. The medical device industry, for example, is vocal in expressing the view that FDA is too risk, adver risk adverse, too slow, is a barrier to innovation and job creation, and that the solution is removal of some of the regulation regulators or modification of the device approval process or both. This idea appeared as recently as last week in an article on the front page of the New York Times, the subject of which is venture capitalists put money on easing medical device rules. The second paragraph of that article says, rein in the Food and Drug Administration's uncertain approval process for new medical devices, urged the Minnesota Congressman Eric Paulson, or Minnesota and other states stand to lose up to 400,000 jobs because of lost investment in the device industry. The article goes on in the next paragraph to point out that Congressman Paulson's uh, campaign commi committee had recently had the great good fortune to receive $74,000 from people who invest in device companies. <coughs> I'm sure it was just random chance that they found his account. Another example <clears throat> involves the issue of cost and access to medical products. Cost is not part of FDA's current statutory calculus. When escalating health care costs are one of the greatest challenges facing our country, a fair question is whether it makes sense to divorce drug and device approval decisions from questions of their cost and access to these products. <clears throat> there are also questions about whether the agency's method of regulating is the most effective use of its limited resources. For many years, rulemaking has been the agency's overwhelmingly dominant mode of regulation. A preference for rules over adjudication is perhaps inevitable, given that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is not a model of clarity in an, in an inevitable consequence of numerous legislative com compromises and piecemeal enactments. In addition, the sweep of FDA's regulatory reach favors rulemaking over adjudication. The off-cited figure is that FDA regulates 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. economy. It is not practical and it is potentially unfair to regulate that much activity one case at a time via adjudication. The question remains, however, whether FDA has been too rule-reliant and failed to bring a sufficient number of enforcement cases to make its rules credible. Over the years, while FDA's responsibilities have grown and the number of FDA-regulated products has increased, the level of agency enforcement activity has declined. In 1975, for example, the agency brought 435 seizure actions those being actions to seize unsafe or insanitary food or health products, and 29 injunction cases, cases against firms to stop unsafe or insanitary manufacturing production or distribution practices. Twenty years later, in 1995, the numbers had declined. There were 73 seizures and eight injunctions. By 2008, it was eight seizures and five injunctions. There has been an increase in the level of enforcement activity in the past couple of years, but the level of enforcement activity is still quite modest as an absolute matter and is particularly so when compared to the agency's overall regulatory output and the number of firms subject to its jurisdiction. FDA was conceived, structured, and has operated as a domestic regulatory agency on the assumption that it could do its job by regulating industries making or growing products in the United States. The world has changed, however, and the marketplace of FDA-regulated products is now global. <clears throat> 
In 2011, nearly 24 million shipments of FDA-regulated products, food, medical devices, drugs, cosmetics, radiation-emitting devices, and tobacco products, will arrive at U.S. ports of entry. These millions of shipments come from more than 150 countries, from more than 300,000 facilities, and involve 130,000 importers of record. Imports of FDA-regulated products have quadrupled over the past decade. Our nation's heavy reliance on imported food and medical products poses new public health risks and requires major changes in how regulation is conducted. When, for example, we experience an outbreak of food-caused deaths or illnesses in the United States, as occurred recently with cantaloupes, tracing the outbreak back to its root cause is essential to limit exposure and to prevent recurrence. This traceback task is difficult enough when the product is produced domestically. The, the problem becomes, becomes considerably more complex, but no less important when the potential source of the offending product is a farm or processing facility on the other side of the world. Increasingly, active pharmaceutical ingredients and components of medical devices are manufactured outside the United States. A central tenant of FDA's regulatory regime is that these products are to be manufactured in accordance with current good manufacturing practices. The fundamental principles of the governing rules require that a manufacturer has control over its manufacturing processes and is able to document that control. FDA's ability to confirm compliance and to enforce these rules through inspections of non-U.S. facilities is limited. Imported products also pose risks from economically motivated intentional adulteration or counterfeiting. This has occurred with pharmaceuticals, human food, and pet food. American consumers do not have one standard for domestic products and another standard for imported products. The American people expect their food to be safe and their medical products to be safe and effective, irrespective of the product's country of origin. FDA's challenge, therefore, is how to meet that expectation in a world in which increasingly these regulated products are imported from other countries. The, the options are fairly limited. Scale and resources make it impractical to inspect with regularity all the non-U.S. production facilities, farms, and manufacturing facilities producing for the U.S. market. There are also serious limitations to using inspections at the border as the principal means of identifying unsafe or otherwise vi violative products. These limitations include the mismatch between the inspection resources and the volume of imports and the need for expedited review of many products to avoid spoilage. Necessity dictates that import importers be responsible for assuring the integrity of their products. The framework has to be that those bringing products into this country are responsible for ensuring that their products are produced, packaged, and transported in accordance with science-based, prevention-based standards. The agency's regulatory responsibility is to articulate clear standards while industry bears the burden and the responsibility of compliance. The Food Safety Modernization Act, which became law in January, reflects this approach. That act requires that each importer of food perform risk-based foreign supplier verification activities, the nature of which FDA is to define by regulations. The global supply chain of regulated products means that FDA will increasingly need to rely on the regulatory regimes of the countries in which products originate and the countries through which products pass en route to the United States. 
This need to rely on the regulatory regimes of other countries is a cause for concern, but is unavoidable. The new food safety law requires FDA to develop within two years a comprehensive plan to expand the technical, scientific, and regulatory food safety capacity of foreign governments and their respective food industries from which foods are exported to the United States. That is a tall order. Moreover, this is a task which must be approached with humility because no one can legitimately claim that the food safety protection system in the U.S. does not have its weaknesses. The case for strengthening regulatory regimes in other countries must be made on the ground that it is good for the exporting country. Exporting countries have a strong national brand interest in having U.S. consumers trust in the safety of their products. That trust will grow and be maintained by developing the regulatory regimes of those countries. The force of this argument is undercut, however, by competing demands for scarce public resources. Again, this is as true and is as true in the United States as it is elsewhere. The United States Congress is far more likely to give FDA new regulatory responsibilities than it is to give FDA additional budget resources to meet those responsibilities. Another complicating factor is that exporting countries, especially those with enormous populations like China and, in and India, face a potential unhappy trade-off between raising food safety standards to satisfy the standards of countries to which they wish to export and producing enough food to feed their large domestic populations. As I believe these various examples illustrate, FDA faces the tension of the difference between the strong consensus around the question of the need for FDA and the lack of a consensus around the questions of how FDA should operate and what it should do to meet that need. The gap between these two is not a trivial matter. In the end, <clears throat> governing and regulating are not primarily about vision, nor are they about theory. They are about execution. They involve managing complex organizations comprised of a large number of people of varying backgrounds, skills, and abilities and having them perform day in and day out to solve tough problems like assuring the safety of the food supply and assuring that safe and effective drugs and medical devices get to the market while preventing unsafe and ineffective ones from reaching the market. Successful execution of these important and difficult tasks virtually presupposes agreement about how what needs to be done is done. The absence of agreement regarding the how of regulation inevitably diminishes regulatory effectiveness. We in this country are not alone in our concern about the effectiveness of our administrative agencies. I had the opportunity this past June to visit Beijing and Shanghai on behalf of FDA. In Beijing, I met with a group of faculty and graduate students at Peking University Law School for a discussion about FDA and food and drug regulatory issues more generally. A young woman in the group asked the highly perceptive question of how do you know if an administrative agency is actually making a difference? This is a good question. And it is one which is, which is not asked as frequently as it should be. How then does one know? The starting point must be for an agency to articulate clearly what constitutes success. If an agency does not begin by defining success, it can never be said to have failed or succeeded because no one, including the agency, knows what constitutes success or failure. 
To be meaningful, an agency needs to define success with precision. An amorphous goal, such as protecting the public health, is too general a definition of success to be meaningful because it is not measurable. Specific public health metrics must be identified so progress against those metrics can be measured. Consider, for example, FDA's new responsibility to regulate, but not outlaw, tobacco products. The Center for Disease Control estimates that 46 million adult Americans smoke. An enormous amount of data has been accumulated over many years confirming the health risks and costs of smoking. These data show that smoking is the largest cause of preventable deaths in our country and that there are enormous costs associated with treating people with smoking-caused illnesses. The public health case for reducing the number of smokers is stated easily. Reducing the number of smokers will, will prevent premature, premature deaths, it will improve the health of those who quit or never start, and it will result in lower costs for the health care system overall. As an example of what FDA is to do by way of regulating while not outlawing tobacco products, Congress directed FDA to promulgate a rule requiring cigarette manufacturers to put graphic images on cigarette packages depicting the health risks of, of smoking. The rationale of the pr proposed warnings is that having graphic images on cigarette packages will affect behavior by discouraging people from starting to smoke and encouraging current smokers to quit. Predictably, the tobacco industry has challenged these warnings on First Amendment and other grounds. Assuming the warnings are upheld and ultimately implemented, the proof of whether the images make a difference is whether the number of smokers declines. That is, after all, the point of the warnings and indeed is the point of FDA's having jurisdiction over tobacco products. The purpose of regulation is to make a difference, not to add to the volume of legally valid regulations. Promulgating regulations is only a means, not an end, and it is certainly not the reason Congress gave FDA regulatory authority over tobacco. Food safety is another example. CDC publishes data on food-related illnesses and deaths, of which there are approximately 3,000 in the United States each year. A relevant measure of the, of the effectiveness of the FDA's increased regulatory activity in the food safety area is whether those numbers adjusted for changes in population decline. Now, fairness requires recognizing <coughs> that there are complexities associated with assessing accurately FDA's effectiveness. A critical part of FDA's work involves acting to prevent bad things from happening. The most famous example of this at FDA is FDA's failure to approve the drug thalidomide when the drug was approved in Europe. FDA's failure to, to follow Europe's lead prevented untold numbers of American children from being born with serious birth defects. Success here meant injuries were avoided because a product was not approved, a type of regulatory success which is difficult to identify and measure. Nevertheless, and recognizing the, the difficulties, those who believe in the importance of regulation as an essential tool in protecting consumers by preventing those with market power from abusing that power, and I count myself in that group, must take seriously the task of setting and transparently disclosing objective metrics against which regulatory performance can be judged. There is great truth to the statement that it, if, it is, if it is not measured, it won't get done. That statement applies to the wide spectrum of administrative agencies, from an agency responsible for food and drug safety to one responsible for filling potholes. Now, FDA has made a start in this area. FDA publishes on its FDA track website 
data for the various offices and centers so that the, the public can see what the agency says it is going to do, what its goals are, and how the agency is, is performing against those goals. This effort is only a start, however, because the data track currently focuses on things like timely completion of regulatory or administrative actions, as distinguished from measuring the agency's performance in accomplishing its major public health objectives of, for example, reducing the number of smokers or reducing the number of food-related illnesses or reducing the obesity epidemic which plagues our country. FDA's timely accomplishment of its smaller regulatory tasks is not unimportant, but in all fairness, those tasks are not the reason Congress created and funds FDA, nor are these smaller tasks of much interest to the American public, nor should they be. The most basic principles of administrative law hold that administrative agencies are required to comply with the statutes pursuant to which they are authorized, and agencies are bound to comply with their own rules. In other words, an agency must not violate the law. While that much is to be expected, it is not sufficient. The law's equivalent of the Hippocratic oath, Oath's first do no harm, is not a reason to create an administrative agency nor does it provide a basis for, an eva for evaluating an agency's performance. In the century since The Jungle was published, there has been a proliferation of regulatory agencies at all levels of government in the United States. Despite this, we know too little about how well these agencies actually perform. We, we need to demand greater clarity of agencies in stating how their performance is to, be is to be judged and more data about how, in fact, agencies are performing against those stated criteria. FDA operates in the sensi sensitive space of public health, balancing safety, risk, and benefit, and often it must make decisions based on imperfect or incomplete information. FDA will always be the subject of substantial criticism, some fair and some not. Unfair criticisms are best answered and the larger case for regulation is made most effectively by FDA's articulating clearly the criteria against which agency performance should be judged and disclosing in real time actual agency performance data. What is clear is that, the, is that the need for an effective FDA is every bit as great now as it was at the time of the jungle. And arguably, the task of protecting Americans is more complicated now than it was then. <clears throat> Disparaging government is currently highly fashionable in our country. We should be cautious about this tendency and remember that we need our governmental institutions and we need them to work. The wholesale trashing of public institutions and those who work to maintain those institutions weakens the institutions and thereby weakens their ability to protect the public. We need to return to a time when public service is honored, respected, and yes, encouraged. The active debates in this country about regulation are close to the core of our never-ending national debate about the proper role of government, including the role of the federal government as compared to that of state and local governments. Demonstrated agency performance will increase public support for the critically important work which administrative agencies like FDA do and ultimately provides the best answer to the question of why we need these agencies and, indeed, why we need an effective government. Thank you very much. Uh, so Ralph has kindly agreed to take questions. And uh, if you have questions or comments, please come up to the microphones.
because this is being webcast and that's the only way that the audience can hear you. Uh, yes, I'm curious if you've had the opportunity to uh, study any foreign uh, agencies analogous to the FDA and if you think there are any practices we could adopt here or do you feel especially in emerging countries that they are putting uh, economic growth ahead of public safety? Uh, that's a very good. I, the, the, the short answer, is I certainly cannot claim to have studied other systems. Um, what I can say is that there is, you know, great interest and awareness um, in FDA of, of trying to learn uh, from other systems. Um, and I, there's a great interest in the Canadian system. New, and the New Zealand food safety system and, and other places, and um, there are increasing activities to work with um, with other countries. FDA over the last few years has established offices um, in in China, in India, in Latin America, um, as just examples. Uh, both for reasons of providing technical support. Um, to those regulatory systems as well as as a way of having people on the ground for inspection purposes and others. Um, now, the, be the belief, uh, and I, I don't just say this as someone who worked at FDA, people in other countries say this, um, the, b the belief is that, that the FDA and the United States system is, is more or less the gold standard in the world. And that, of course, that's, I would say, that's good and we should be proud of that. Um, but we shouldn't take from that that there's, that A, the system can't be improved because it can be and we can learn from other countries. And again, as I said, given that the enormous you know, economic transformation of our own country where we have moved to being an import, importing country, uh, including of FDA products, uh, FDA regulated products, um, we're going to need to, to rely more heavily on regulatory regimes in other countries. So, so it's in our interest that they become more robust and effective. Um, if you have a metric, a public health metric, like the food-related injuries or deaths that is, you know, more or less accurate and, and measured and agreed as a decent metric. Um, in, in the case of more importation of more products com coming from overseas, if, the, if this metric as a percentage of the population uh, doesn't change or actually decreases, um, is that, what does that say about the FDA's role in the promulgation of, of future regulations? Is that an argument to do nothing? No, that's, I mean, I would say um, it would inform an argument to do something different. Um, and as, as I said, there, um, there are lots of choices uh, that have to be made all the time. How much of your time are you going to spend, for example, um, issuing rules as compared to putting people out in the field to do inspections? Um, I mean, it, it's not, I'm not here arguing for the FDA budget. I'm just taking it as a fact that whatever the budget is or is going to be, it's going to be modest as compared to the task. We're a country of over 300 million people who all of them like to eat, for example. Uh, and so how you secure and protect that food supply is going to be a very challenging problem and you can't do all things. And so you, you need to, to measure what you do so that you know whether it makes a difference or not. I mean, if you, if you find out that what you're doing isn't impacting, isn't moving the needle, it doesn't mean that 
you're a bad person doesn't mean that you didn't make a reasonable decision back then, but what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, inspecting a different result. Um, it suggests that you should do something different. I guess what I'm asking is, is if the, if the metric, for example, the food-related injuries or deaths, mm -hmm. is actually going down on its own without additional FDA action, for instance, via market forces, tort forces, whatever the case is, um, what do you think is the proper response in that, in that situation? Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you raise at least two points, one of which I should acknowledge. I mean, there, there admittedly are difficulties, you know, in, in a system this complex and a country this big in, in being able to say anything, anything is, was the single cause or effect. I mean, that's a completely fair point. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think you, you'd reach the conclusion that if – <clears throat> excuse me, that if the number of food-related illnesses was going down and you concluded, fairly concluded as you suggested, that that was for some non-regulatory reason, it was because of a change in the behavior in the marketplace, that therefore the right thing would be to step back from regulating. I think that, I think the premise, you know, is, and I and I was one that I could argue for strongly, is that um, in the absence of an effective regulatory system, you will get an increased number of bad actors. You get a sin significant number of bad actors even with a moderately effective regulatory system. So I don't, you know, I, I personally don't believe, and I don't believe the evidence would support that removing food safety regulation um, would provide greater safety, just as I don't believe that n not having a nationally run um, air traffic control system would lead to greater air safety. I mean, it seems to me it's a pretty good idea that you've got someone uh, running air traffic control. You mentioned um, there's talk whether or not the FDA should get involved in price control of drugs and medical devices. One, do you think the department has the resources to do that? And two, do you think, um, I mean, what role do you think they should play and how, how would they measure those, uh, a definition of a success? Yeah. The, the answer to the first part of the question is no. Um, the, the, I mean, there's, there's no current capacity uh, to to consider price, and there are no, there, there are certainly are economists who work at the FDA um, because, just to take one example, every time the agency promulgates a regulation, there has to be an economic analysis done uh, as part of the rulemaking process <coughs> of the economic impact of the rule. So there are economists who, who work there. but. Um, you know, there, there was a big issue while I was at the FDA over um, the price charged uh, for a so-called orphan drug. Um, and, you know, among the arguments made in response to the position the agency took was, well, the agency has no, no basis for saying what should be a fair price here. Um, and there was shall we say, forced to that argument. Other questions or comments? Uh, wait, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I just had a question. I think your idea or your solution to the disaffection of the public with agencies and government in general is brilliant in your idea of developing metrics that focus on what the agency is supposed to do and how well they're doing. Is, it, is the FDA doing that yet, or yeah. is any agency or government uh, you would set as the model? Um, well, the the actual the actual model and the history of of doing this kind of thing reasonably effectively in government um, began with um, the the New York City Police Department. Um, the commissioner of police in New York. Um, had a very, very good insight. His insight was 
a measure of effectiveness of whether we're doing a better job as a police department is whether the murder rate goes down. Fewer murders is a good thing. Most people would agree with that. So let's see how we would go about accomplishing that. And so number one, they start by disclosing what's the murder rate today. Number two, they mapped out where the murders occurred. That suggested to them a strategy about how to go after them. It's called cops on the dots. Put the cops where the dots are. You've got red dots where there are a bunch of red dots where there are a bunch of murders. There ought to be a bunch of cops out there. Uh, when the when the mayor of Baltimore, for whom I worked, became mayor, uh, we had a serious murder problem in in Baltimore, um, and this approach was adopted. Um, and we would have sessions uh, every week where we would go through uh, and debrief the data on all the murders. And, you know, you'd put up a map of the city and where'd they happen and who were they and who, who did it and who got killed. Um, and then tried to, and then be questions of the police department, now what are you doing? And over time, the rate came down. Um, so the, yes, there have been, um, there have been efforts. And th this approach was carried forward um, at the FDA. And if you look on FDA's website, and if you look at FDA track, um, you'll see the kind of data that is tracked and publicly disclosed uh, on, with respect to the various centers. As I said, I think it's a good effort and it's the right effort. It's only a beginning because it's, it's tracking what in the total scheme of things are, are the minor tasks as compared to the major goals. I mean, there's obviously complexity, and I'm not minimizing that, but. Uh, if I may, I'm going to suggest that we break now. We have refreshments outside, um, and uh, if you'd like to continue to converse with, uh, with Ralph, please do so. Uh, I want to thank him again for a terrific talk. Please join me. We have a little.